Welcome to Speak the Truth, everybody. My name is Gary Johnson. I'm the founder and publisher of BlackMenInAmerica.com. And we've got a full agenda today and a full house. And we have maybe a couple of even OGs in the house. But you see the OG behind me. You see the chosen one, Mr. Harold Bell, a DC radio broadcast legend. He is the recipient of the 2020 National Association of Black Journalists Pioneer Award. I'm going to kick it over to Mr. Harold Bell because he has a lot of tricks and treats for us today. Go ahead, Mr. Bell. I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Chris is going, my co host is going to open up uh, today. Chris, bring it on. All Chris right. is our, 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 our youth, our young man on the set that, uh, that educates us. Come on in, Chris. Yes, absolutely. Well, welcome to the show, everyone. And today, like I said, we're going to talk about 47 years later, how Mr. Bell is on fire right now. We've got the, as my dad mentioned, the 2020 NABJ Pioneer Award. We've got, uh, he was a panelist recently for a public television on Ken Burns show for the Muhammad Ali documentary. There's a, a piece that recently ran on ABC, um, I mean, USA Channel 9 on, uh, for Mr. Bell of uh, the Von Martin show. Uh, appearance as well, and uh, many other recent appearances, as well as David Aldridge uh, doing a write-up for The Athletic about Mr. Bell. Ba and um, basically, the theme of today is, 47 years later, why did it take so long for Mr. Bell to get this recognition? The reporter who was stamped by Muhammad Ali himself and, and given the interview after the rumble in the jungle. Um, why is it taking so long for Mr. Bell to finally get his flowers and get the recognition uh, among the, the mainstream media in, in the mainstream world. Okay. All right. That's a good question, Chris. <laughs> That's a good question. What it is, uh, I think what has happened over the years is that when you tell the truth, a lot of folks don't want to hear the truth, man. It's simple as that. They want to hear the truth as long as about some as it is about someone else, but they don't want to hear the truth about themselves. And I think that's I think that that's the bottom line. That's what it's all about, man. If you go be in the public space as a media personality and as a journalist, you, you got to tell the truth, man. You got to bring people the truth. And uh, David Aldridge uh, wrote a piece in the Athletic, as you were saying, and I, there was a, a paragraph in there that that you know, David, David, I go way back. You know, when he was at the Washington Post, TNT, you know, we go way back. And um, in, in the last, in the opening paragraph, he said, Harold Bell still does a weekly show, Speak the Truth, on YouTube that runs the gamut from sports to politics. He still gives honest, unvarnished opinions on the people and the issues of the day. And that's what we folks are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be bringing the truth to you. And a lot of them don't, man. They, they're most of them are a lot of cheerleaders, a lot of frauds who don't do their homework. And that's what I do. I do my homework and that's what it's all about. I'm taking time out. We're gonna take time out today and uh, really uh, pay tribute uh, to the brother that really put me on page one. They gave me this credibility. And I'm talking about the one and only Muhammad Ali. Yesterday marked the 30th, the 40, I'm sorry, the 47th anniversary of Humble in the Drungle. Let's, let's run that uh, please, Gary. All right. This is my interview with Muhammad Ali. 1974. Everybody's always talking about the controversial Muhammad Ali, heavyweight champion of the world. I talked with Muhammad, and here's what he had to say about all this. <laughs> It's uh, like you said, it's hit, not be hit. Rhythm and timing, footwork, a left jab, right cross, you know, might slip a punch by two inches, then tag it. He might throw a left jab, and you might pull back just enough to get away. He might stop from a half inch and hit him and back over with the right hand. It's all time and rhythm. Everything's in motion. So, but fighting is more like a Joe Frazier. Just put your head down and come in take punches just to hit nose hanging off, ears twisted, eyes crossed, just, just don't care. 
but uh, Box was one like Sugar Ray Robinson was in his day, or Joe Lewis, myself, people, you know how I dance and jump around. Even I'm the ropes, I'm not getting hit, I'm blocking them. That's called the rope dope the new style of the Mirage. It's a science. So that's how they differ. George Foreman is a slugger too. That's how he lost the fight, if you remember. He just put his head down, just kept swinging and didn't realize where he was hitting. He just wanted to hit. Oh, loses his head. A fighter is one who loses his head, he can't think. And but a man who's smart, taking his time, jab, jab, you know, I miss a right hand, he'd hit me. And then when I get him in the ropes, he wouldn't lose his head and slug it out. He just back off and tell me to come on out to the center of the ring. That's a box. The slug is one who just put it like a girl, you know, just get mad and she told a lie on you, darling. She did. I can't stand and stop pulling her hair. Just get my man. All right, all right, all right. That's uh that two minute interview there and that whole interview in nineteen seventy four. That was the only time we talked about boxing uh, during the whole interview. We talked about the game called life. That was and the and the things that we talked about back then, 47 years ago, are still revelant today, man. Still revelant today. Now we got a lot of new folks with us today. And Gary, you got your clock. Uh, we, everybody's gonna get a chance to speak. And when you're kind of going a little over, Gary will give you a little, little ring a ding and let you know that you got 30 seconds to close up and we'll come back to you, okay? But we want to want to get everybody involved uh, to do uh, exactly what's going on uh, with today's show. We want to pay tribute to not only uh, my dear friend Muhammad Ali, but also we want to pay tribute to another great guy, another great athlete, the greatest of all time, Hank Aaron. So we'll be talking about both of these guys. I want to start out uh, introducing uh, one of our guests, and then everybody else is going really going to be introducing themselves. But this guy and I go back a, a little bit. Uh, he was born in Washington, D.C., uh, left to, uh, to grow up in Alexandria, Virginia, where he later became an outstanding boxer. He was ranked number one in his weight class and number four in the world. He was on his way to the 88 Olympic Games. I mean, he was, he was on fire. But then he had a, a tragic incident that kind of turned him around. He lost his infant daughter. And uh, really, uh, he lost his weight after that. You know, he turned to drugs. Uh, his home became a jail cell but he recovered and got his act together and now doing some great things uh, in Alexandria, Virginia with young people, you know, in all walks of life. He's, um, he's a speaker, motivational speaker. He has a book out and he's an author. So I would like to wa welcome the one and only, uh, they call him the beast, uh, Anthony Suggs. How you doing, Tony? Hey, how you doing, Mr. Bell? How you doing? I'm hanging in here, my brother. Tony also received uh, the Kids in Trouble Lifetime Achievement Award years ago. I, I, I gave him that award, but he's had received a lot of other awards, and he's out there in the community. Tony, uh, take a minute and, and give some folks your, your background uh, and, and who you are and where you came from. Okay. Um. My, again, my name is Tony Suggs. Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., Southeast, well, um, Northeast, then we moved to Southeast, and, you know, it was a lot of things going on, so my family wanted to make better for us, so we moved out to Virginia, down Dale City at that time, and, um, but the, the, the things that was going on at, in the house in Southeast, you know, we took that with us to Dale City, so my, my parents finally split you know, because of the geographical cure didn't work. We and um and um when my parents split, my mom left us with me and my younger brother with my dad, and we wind up in Alexandria, Virginia. And um and you know, Alexandria was just one of those spots that everybody was kin folks, everybody was related, and I love that unity, you know, uh, and um since it was just me and my brother and we didn't have no relatives, I made, you know, the city my home, you know, and I became family with the city, you know, and um and um 
I started boxing after playing football for T.C. Williams, getting my ankle broke. I didn't want to participate in team sports anymore, and um, I found boxing and uh, just fell in love with boxing. My father always taught me how to box because he was North Carolina State Penitentiary champ. This is his picture back there behind me, you know. Um, and um, when I started boxing, I just fell in love with it, you know. Uh, and, and I skyrocketed to the top, winning five Golden Gloves, four U.S. ABF tournaments, um, you know, then wind up punching my way to the number one boxer in the country with a record of 138 and 12 with 116 knockouts, you know, I would, and I was a puncher, one of them, Joe Frazier, uh, George Foreman type punchers, and, um, and, and, I was one fight for making this dream come true because I wanted to make sure my kids never had to experience any of the things that I went through in life, you know, the dysfunction, the the, the shock, the trauma, you know, that I went through in life. And um, while I'm one fight for making this dream come true, you know, my daughter dies while I'm at the Olympic Training Center, you know. And um, one thing my mother taught me before she left is 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 the faith, the power and the glory of God, you know, and um, I always took that with me. And, um, but when my daughter died, I felt like God did me wrong. I felt like the God has turned his back on me. And um, so I start crack was just coming out at that time. So I wind up smoking crack, getting addicted to crack in and out of jail. Um, then one day I got served eight years. You know, the judge was smacking me on the hands as long as the Olympics was still in view. But um, when in 1989, when the Olympics was over, and I got and I got a charge, the judge served me eight years, and um, and and I, you know, and then and then at that time, uh, my 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 drug treatment counselor said that you know if you went into prison with the with the problems and situations you got that you never dealt with as a child, you're going to come back out the same person you was that you went in. And um, so we, he said, you need a long-term drug treatment. So um, he wrote a letter to the jail, to the judge. The judge considered my crime and got me back in court and suspended the time to successful completion of the drug treatment program. I went in, completed the program, and, and the rest is history. You know, um built my faith back up in God. I knew and I realized that God was with me all the time. And um I went on I, I messed up my prime. I was like I my my name in the ring was Tony the B Suggs, you know, but um my I left my prime years out there on the street with the crack and the jail. But so I, I try and teach kids today how to be that beast that I was, you know, to, to fall in love with the process of becoming a beast, you know, and um, so, um, I like I said, I got all my time and everything suspended, so I told, I promised God that I would do what I could do to help kids not travel down the same road I went down, and um, I wrote a book, I was a featured article in the Washington Post magazine, two so, documentaries. Hold it right there, Tony, Let's, we'll come back to you, I think we got all that information and it's a great story. We're gonna come back to you. I want to go up here and introduce another family uh, of boxers, uh, the Maxwell Taylor family. Butch, are you there? But okay, Butch. How about introducing? Uh, let's give a uh, introduction of your family and a little background on on your boxing achievements. They have to unmute lower left hand corner. Uh, unmute, unmute yourself, Butch. Unmute in the left hand corner. Unmute. Lower left hand corner. Click on the microphone. Gotcha, there you go. Gotcha. There you go. There you go. All right. Okay, Butch, give us a little bit. How you doing, Madonna? Maxwell family. I'm going fine. You look the same. You ain't change on us. <laughs> give All us right, a little right, back. Right. Back to Taylor. And uh, Coach Dave Sewell and my other son, younger son, Emmanuel Taylor. Okay. Yeah. I hear you. Uh huh. Tell, give us a little background on on the, on the boxing uh, in the Taylor family. 
Okay, start uh, off with Greg, me. Do you, do you have those uh, uh, photographs of, of the family? Sure do. While Butch can give us a little background. Sure okay. do. Okay, start with me. Yeah. Uh, and for Greg, Charles Mooney once taught me off, though. Nope. Yeah. And, um, I saw a, a, a little kid on TV with big with big ears, and it said Charles Mooney. And um, I saw him going. He's in the army. I said that's where I should go. Invest myself. And uh, join the army. Start boxing. And I loved it. Then I just kept on doing. That came an army coach. That came out. Then my son was born. That raised him when he. Before he started walking, this matter of fact, was boxing with him and stuff. And that family right there, you see right here, I stay in the fire right there. They throw neighbors. Mm -hmm. Now, that's about it, my, my career. Okay. Uh, now, you, how, many, uh, um, how many of your sons do you have there with you now? Two. Two? Uh, how about yeah, them? One? Introduce uh, them? Introducing them to us. Okay, this is uh, Max Taylor, Taylor. Hey, Max. Emmanuel Taylor. All right. Now, look, I want to thank you guys. We'll get back and I want to talk to you about Muhammad Ali and what kind of influence that he had on, on your boxing career as, as a man and as an athlete. I want to go now to uh, my dear friend, uh, a comedian. Can I show you something? You show you something? I, yeah, go ahead. Show me something. What you got? <laughs> oh yeah! Oh, that's Muhammad Ali. All right. Okay. I made that clock. Uh huh. All right. <laughs> TikTok. Thank you, Bruce. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We want to come to a, a comedian, uh, my dear friend. Uh, all things boxing. Uh, Corey Lasan. Corey has been with me for years. Uh, different um, programs. Corey, come on in and uh, give us a little background on what you're doing. I know you love boxing, there's no doubt about it. Uh, how, how how were you influenced by Muhammad Ali, uh, Koi? <laughs> hey, uh, how you doing there? It's great to be here, huh? Yes, indeed, it's exciting. I love the sport, I've always loved the sport. One thing I loved about the sport is that I could relate to it. How can I relate? I wasn't a heavyweight, of course not. But what I've related was just the, the feeling and the excitement not just that, but just you can be any size, any weight and do business and do work. You know what I mean? And, and, and you could see the person's heart and know that they're trying to do the best that they can. And, and, and they just bring it from all that they've been through and then they bring it in the ring. And, and what you see is that result, whether they win or lose, everybody deserves that respect in the ring. So, you know, that, that just made me get involved in a sport versus NFL versus all that, because again, I didn't see anybody my weight size in the NFL, but I did see people my weight size in the box sport of boxing and it was kicking tail. So, uh, but you got the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, you know, he started um, just talking the, the, the trash talking and just being the exciting fighter that he was. And he already called to say that he's the greatest of all time before anybody else could say that he was. So everyone has now, even his grandson, Nico Ali, that we just recently saw fight. So the legacy is continuing on with the new heavyweights that are out there. And I'm excited so much to be a part of the show and I'm excited to talk about it. All right. Let's go up uh, to uh, Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson is from out in Alexandria, Virginia. He's, uh, he's been on this show several times, has been a contributor. Michael, uh, uh, of course, I brought uh, Bert Sugar, and we had a uh, uh, Jack Johnson exhibit over at uh, Charles Houston uh, Rec Center a couple of years ago. What, what about uh, the influence of uh, Muhammad Ali to you? Well, thanks for letting me on the show, Harold. But uh, when I had my hair and uh, I was growing up, uh, everybody said I was like Muhammad Ali because I talked so much trash. Only thing about it was I just didn't like boxing and getting hit. I had a younger brother that boxed with uh, Suggs, and uh, I bought him some, uh, I don't know if Tony remember this, I bought him some uh, uh, tassel boots like Ali wore. The only thing about it was they were fighting amateur. My brother fell out the ring. And they wouldn't let him back in. I had just made a bet with a guy, you know, 
that my brother was gonna win. So I uh, was ready to fight the guy in the audience. But anyway, uh, my whole thing about Muhammad Ali was that he endured, he persevered, and the strength that he had. Uh, I use a lot of that myself when I deal with some of these uh, people out here in Alexandria, which was basically the last uh, hub of the Confederate Army where they broke it down at, and some of that stuff still, well, as you know, Harold, exists today in Alexandria. But uh, just his perseverance and his strength and that he would always uh, not run away from a challenge, but run to it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go up here to Jacques Chavi. Jacques Chavi, Jacques, 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 Jacques. Let's say Jacques. Come on in, Jacques. Hey, hey, uh, hello. I'd like to say uh, hello to everybody and uh, thanks uh, for the uh, insight and the information. Uh, I just want to briefly say to the boxers, some of you probably know my brother, uh, Kenny Chevalier. He's a uh, referee, probably referee some of you guys' fights and some of the uh, sons probably of Mr. Taylor. He's a real short referee, uh, walks with a limp, so he came out of wreck with Ray Leonard. I've always enjoyed the sport uh, and myself and certainly uh, uh, Muhammad Ali. And even right today, I, I, I like to think that I have some Muhammad Ali in me. I was in the Nation of Islam for a while. I believe that no matter what you do in life, you always should speak up about society and what goes on with the ills and the uh, 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 good stuff as well as the bad stuff uh, here in America. I see the Taylor family getting excited. Y'all must know my brother Kenny. They they all ran up to the camera. Well, if Kenny did you wrong in the ring, man, don't blame me. I took karate. I, <laughs> right. So, and I also want to say, I got into the ring with Ray Leonard when I was about 15, 14 or 15, and uh, Ray hit me about four times before I could blink and before he ever turned pro or anything, right? So I immediately left there and I went and signed up for karate class. So I said, if anybody ever punched me again, I'm going to be able to use my feet and hands. True story. But anyway, I just wanted to get that in. All right. Let's go to Michael Jackson, attorney Michael Jackson uh, out of Selma, Alabama. I understand, Michael, you were in Atlanta, your home for the big game last night uh, with uh, the Braves and the Astros. Tell us, uh, Michael, I know you, how you feel about uh, Muhammad Ali. Give us your insight uh, for a minute. Well, yeah, I'm still in Atlanta here. I'm in my hotel room right now. But, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali was my favorite boxer. And I hadn't even thought about this for a while until y'all start uh, talking about all this. When I was in private practice, I represented this guy who was going to uh, turn pro. Uh, and he had an attempted murder charge because some guy had beat him, some gang member had beat him with a baseball bat him and his brother, and he later saw that guy, let's say two years later at a traffic light and shot the guy in the face, allegedly, because I got him off. Uh, this was before I became district attorney, and uh, thankfully he, you know, he kept his life going, And uh, but I will say this, your first guess, I'm always interested in how people are able to uh, hook the, the score to drugs, you know, the folks that get off and stay off to be honest, that's, that's kind of rare. Most people, they relapse and relapse the rest of their lives. And this guy has been able to, to lick that. So I'm always curious as to what the, what's the difference between him and other folks that get on drugs. Okay, we'll get back. We'll get back to Tony with that. I want to bring in my dear friend uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, your schoolmate, uh, Pat Michael. Uh, this guy is... Um, I'm a community person. He has, um, he's the manager of an RBI team that's connected with the uh, Atlanta Braves. He's an account executive for um, CBS 46. He's a former president of 100 Black Men. Uh, he's been cited by uh, his TV channel as a role model in the community. He has touched hundreds and hundreds uh, of young men. And I know he was a very close friend with Hank Aaron. So I want to talk, I want to bring in my dear friend for him to talk about Hank Aaron and Muhammad Ali because they were, Hank Aaron and Muhammad Ali were dear, dear friends. Uh, Mr. John Hollins. How you doing, John? Hey, I'm good. I'm good, Harold. First of all, thanks for having me as always. Always good to see your panel and people that are there. You know, talking about Muhammad Ali, uh, there's some things that we don't know about each other. So I need to share something with you. Um, 
I was born in Washington, D.C. at Walter Reed. Wow. And my first 13 years of my life, I celebrated January the 17th as my birthday, which is Muhammad Ali's birthday, my favorite athlete of all time. And I was a boxer as a youth. And I didn't find out that my birthday was on the 16th when my 13 year old team won the regional championship and to go to the state championship, you have to have a birth certificate. And when it came back, I read and I said, mom, it say my birthday on the 16th. She said, baby, I got five kids, 16, 17, they close. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, another, another fun fact oh, is man. Um, uh, I was a baseball, I've always been a baseball and football player. But at the boys club, if you get into a scuffle, you got to put the gloves on. I did it two times and knocked out the guys. I'm ambidextrous and box southpaw. And so they said, man, we got to make a box out of you. And so as my man said, I can't remember which one it was. I think it was um, uh, Jacquet. Uh, I didn't like getting hit. So, you know, no, I was real good at hitting people. But they put me in the ring because my first fight was with this guy with a strange name uh, on the opposite boys club. He had a funny name, so I never forgot it. And uh, they said he's a little bit bigger than you, big old head, and he hit hard. So we're going to put you in the ring with somebody heavier, but then you guys will fight. His name was Evander Holyfield. And, <laughs> and, and, so, and so the guy I went up to fight knocked me down, beat me up. I'm, I'm crying, trying to take out my gloves because I'm going to jack him up and I'm going to fight him because – I don't, I'm not a boxer. They just trying to make me a boxer. And I never fought Holyfield and they didn't have cell phones back then. So I didn't show. So I met Holyfield 20 years later and I'm trying to get his attention. He signed an autograph. And I said, Mr. Holyfield, you may not remember me, but do you remember that time you went to fight and the fighter never showed up? And he turned around and looked. I said, I'm that fighter and you the heavyweight champion. So I'm glad I didn't show up. <laughs> 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 but I know you wanted me to talk about Hank Aaron and I did a lot for the Hank Aaron program here in Atlanta. I met him three times. I can't say that we were personal friends. I'm a personal friend of his son and his son wanted to be on the call today, but he has foot, a football league. And today was his day where he has to meet with all of his coaches at three o'clock. So it just didn't work out, but working around Hank Aaron, people talk about, the humility of a giant. And I tell you, this man, you know, it's like something, something, there was an aura around him. And, you know, sometimes you as a person create that aura around a person, but sometimes they just walk with it. And he had an aura around him that was something special. And uh, when I, when I walked up to him the first time, you know, he didn't sign autographs, didn't take pictures, didn't do it, didn't want to do any of that. And I said, Mr. Aaron, I just want to take a picture with you. I know I'm working with the program, but I've never had a picture with you. He said, sure. And uh, that picture meant a lot to me. But then his wife, you know, when I talked to her at, at the house, she doesn't use a cell phone. She said, John, just leave a message on the answering service and I'll call you back. And she does. She'll call you back. <laughs> Billy will. You know, just a real humble and nice family. And, uh, you know, I celebrate Muhammad Ali's birthday, Martin Luther King's birthday, and my birthday every year by taking a group of kids to the islands and do a humanitarian trip uh, with the RBI team. Uh, we've been to Curacao, and we went with Ozzy Albies, the second baseman for the Braves. His mom made him fly all the way to uh, Curacao uh, to be there because she knows that if it wasn't for people like me, not me personally, but people like me who take interest in kids, that he wouldn't have gotten his opportunity. So he flew, took us all around the island, called up Acuna. Uh, we FaceTimed with him and talked to him. Just a remarkable young man, and I'm truly cheering for the Braves. And I know you guys already got y'all ring with the Nationals, but we need this ring this year, man. We need the night. So I need y'all. I need all the prayers I can get. I'm cheering. If you see that picture behind me, number 18, the Braves honored me as a hometown community hero in 18. And uh, they gave me a jersey and um, and they have some writing on it as well. But, you know, just working with Harold, speaking the truth, he and I met at um, Ben's Chili Bowl in and, 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 uh, Washington, D.C. 
and uh, he read me the riot sack. I ain't going to say what he said. <laughs> I told I told Harold, man, you got the wrong one, buddy. And, then, and next thing you know, we became the best of friends, talk almost every day. And uh, those who know him know what a cherishing uh, opportunity it is to get to know such a powerful and knowledgeable man. And I'm honored to be on your call anytime I can get on to Harold. You know, baseball season just ended for my for my fall guys two weeks ago. I have seven. I'll end with this. I have seven guys with campus visits today uh, this weekend. Uh, four were at Mississippi Valley State. They offered all of them scholarships, and three were at Claflin University, which two were offered scholarships. So my whole objective when I do what I do is to try to get these kids in school and to better their lives. Because I share with them, I threw 91 miles an hour. You never heard of me. If it's not for an education, I wouldn't be at CBS television. So I forced them to understand the importance of education because a lot of coaches out here don't because they're talented. They just tell them, yeah, you're going pro. Your chance of going pro is so slim, you got a better chance of getting hit by a bus. I mean, you know, but I do have 17 guys in the pros. Cedric Mullins played for me, who plays with Baltimore. Kyle Lewis, who is the rookie of the year last year with Seattle. Uh, Curtis Terry, Michael, I could go on and on, but those guys are, are, are one in a few and they're very, very talented. And it takes being in the right place at the right time. It's so many different variables that you really want them to focus on an entrepreneur spirit, and an education. So I'll end there. Harold, thanks Thank for having me. Thank you, John. Herb, come on in, Herb. I see you sitting out there, part of, I think it may be your first time here. Herb, you want to say something uh, as it relates to the program? Are you talking to this Herb? Yes, to I'm to that Herb. <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a couple of Herbs out there. I know there's a Herb from the D.C. area, Herb Martin. And your name looked familiar to me. I'm like, I, I think I dealt with you somewhere along the line when I was working with the South Atlantic. Uh, but we we talked about something. I, I had to contact you about something or other. But uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, actually, Max told me about it. And um, it's interesting. This, this, this intersects a lot of things for me. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. I grew up in Bladensburg. And um, my first experience uh, with boxing – Amateur was Adrian Davis's first coach. I think his name was Rocky Coleman. They called him Sloppy Rocky, mm -hmm. I think. And um, I found all this out years later, like at the Golden Gloves and stuff. But um, you're talking about Muhammad Ali. Now, I will I will admit I, I grew up in a racist family, and I myself was a, a racist white person for a while. And um, I didn't like Muhammad Ali because he was a brash black person, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I apologize for my ignorance in all this. Uh, I accept full responsibility today. But uh, I remember when he fought George Foreman, and I wanted George Foreman to win because George was a quiet guy. You know, he wasn't out there. But I remember when he fought um, Frazier, too. And I remember a picture, I think it was on the front of the Washington Post, and it was Frazier and Ali. Like, they had pictures side by side, and they were looking at each other. And I don't – I don't – remember what all the words were but i just remember seeing that picture and think oh man this is serious you know but um since the that time of course i've learned and matured and um you know i really appreciate the figure that muhammad ali became in our nation and the change in our nation that that he brought about through a very courageous act of defiance you know and and, and i i can appreciate that today uh and it you know, people, I guess you could make it about color, but for me in general, it's a very brave, courageous thing he did. And to me, it's a, it's a very uh, big part of American history. So, um, but uh, really the, for me, this was more about Max and Dave and like uh, Max wasn't able to say a lot. I mean, Max already, I don't know how far it'll go, but you know, Max was a, as a story, uh, military man, as well as a boxer, Dave too. Both of them, my friends, good friends, their sons, who I admire a great deal, the work they did and their accomplishments in boxing. And um, I don't know. That's that's about all I can say, man. But I appreciate you inviting me to talk. Herb, you said a lot, my brother. And I like thank you for coming on the show and, and, and enlightening us about how you once were and how you were able to change, man. That that is tremendous. It really is, man. I thank you for coming on to uh, speak the truth. Let's go down to Tyra. Tyra Wooten. Tyra, you want to come in? Tyra? Okay. Is Tyra there? Okay. Well. Yes. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing, Tyra? 
You want to make a, a statement on uh, Muhammad? Hi, I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? Yes, uh, Muhammad Ali is just, um, he's just a legend, you know, and I had a chance to actually uh, meet his daughter maybe about six years ago, and um, she's a, she was a delight, and um, she let me know. She gave me a lot of great encouragement, outreach, and um, and that's how I met. Um, I mean, you know, Anthony Suggs is my uncle, so I'm here to support him, and um, thankful that I could be, um, support him alongside. So he's great. Okay, thank you, Tyra. Let's go. You're down. welcome. Okay, let's go down to our Suggs. This must be another one of Anthony's. Uh, <laughs> People say, I see Timothy there. This goes out, uh, our Suggs. Come on in and make a statement, please. Take yourself off mute, uh, Suggs. Our Suggs, take yourself off mute. Well, let's go over to Timothy. Timothy, can you hear me, Tim? Okay, Suggs. Oh. Great, Suggs. How are you? Hi, how you doing? Good. I'm just here for support of Anthony. Okay, that is so sweet. We appreciate you. Thank you. Timothy, you like to come in and say something? Okay, Timothy, you got the floor. Hey, everybody. Hey, um, how you doing, man? Good to have you. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Um, I wanted. I want to tell everybody that. Uh, I mean, I I came in a little late, I believe. Uh, I was hearing about the gentleman with the uh, Atlanta Braves. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, including uh, Harold, that has anything to do with the history of sports. Um, and I, I just want to let you know that everything that you guys have achieved to bring sports and, uh, the talent, uh, around the world to, uh, what it is today, trust me, it hasn't been for naught. Uh, the way that the industry is going, we are going places that you have never dreamed of, uh, with technologies, um, uh, uh, things every 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 20 years is a big change that happens worldwide. Uh, there's going to be a big change in sports right now. We're dealing with something called NFTs. Uh, you may have heard of it, uh, non-fungible tokens. And you may also have heard about um, uh, 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 fantasy football, fantasy baseball, and so forth, where if you have, uh, I think Harold, he, he got into something like that. Uh, if you guys have some uh, exchange groups uh, that you're a part of, uh, financial firms that you're a part of, and you've been in the, in the uh, sports industry, you now have an opportunity to make a lot of freaking money based on your history and your repertoire. And what I've, uh, I was telling Harold, what I've been working on for the past 20 years is, is going to make more millionaires than anybody else has done in history. I'm very excited about that. I'm fairly young to have achieved something like this. Um, but uh, what he's achieved, what Harold has achieved with Muhammad Ali and some of the other uh, the greats in, in history, I'm telling you right now, your time has come, man. This is uh, no time in history where, where we're able to achieve, um, you know, statuses and tax brackets that were not available before is now available. So I can answer any and every question that you ever had about uh, anything, including uh, stuff that you may have never heard of at NASA, don't even know. Um, stuff that technology has is not really making privy to people that are in average communities. Uh, stuff is now being, you know, brought to the brought to light. Uh, you may if you have any questions, man, and Harold tell you, I, I, I break some stuff off to him that he would know, he, he didn't hear and even think was possible. Uh, ain't that right, Harold? That's right. You're absolutely right. We yeah, appreciate man. you, Anthony. Make sure anybody wants to get in touch with you, they can get to, in touch with you through me. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Timothy. I mean, Timothy. I want, I want to go back up for a minute because we got to run out. I want to go back up to the Maxwell Taylor family. And Butch, are you still there? Butch, come on back in, Butch. Get off mute, Butch. Butch, get off mute. Mute, you're on mute, Butch. Take yourself off mute. Okay, there you are. We are talking. We are talking. 
Uh, going uh, going out of here, I want you to you know kind of wrap it up for your family. Uh, evidently, you guys have done some tra tremendous things, and I just want to say thank you for for coming on. Uh, speak the truth, and you can come back anytime that you want, man. So uh, give give us a, a little going away out of here. Give us a little little background information on, on on the family and what you guys are planning on doing in the future. What what's happening? I, I let my son speak on that. Wait, okay. Wait. Oh, <laughs> what's, what's going on, everybody? Um, first of all, um, I gotta. I'm with a couple of people that's open up. It's called a Goji Projects. We got a gym that's open up for um for kids and things like that and adults. So it's a program for kids to get you know get them off the street, have them something, have them something to do and things like that. And, um, you know, basically I got other things going on. I got a um production company I just started this year you know next year I open up a barbershop you know things like that so mm -hmm. there's a couple of things I'm doing in the future you know and things so okay. I'm gonna give my little brother Emmanuel to say something okay Emmanuel come on Emmanuel <laughs> uh, my, my name is Emmanuel Transformer Taylor uh, I was rated number two in the country at one point and right now he's being a family man working and just taking care of mine. And that's all I got right now. Okay. Well, let me tell you, Maxwell family. Maxwell family. Any way that, I, that I can help you, any way that I can help you, don't hesitate to call. You got my telephone number. So call me anything that I can do to support what you guys are doing. Okay? Okay. I'm going to talk to Marble Coach Davey. He got give me a little word. Good day. Glad to be part of y'all today. I'm so happy to be here with Manuel and Max. And, and uh, so uh, thank you for the opportunity. And so sky the limit. So you all gonna hear about us again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Let's go, Tony, take a minute uh, before we go out here. Tell us about your book and uh, your website where we can find your book at Amazon or no, uh, Bond and Noble or what? Tell me what's going on. Tony, take yourself off mute, Tony. He's working on it, look like it. Lower left-hand corner, click on the microphone. Click on the microphone, Tony. <laughs> In the lower left-hand corner. Lower left-hand corner. Can you see that that thing down there, the microphone with the cross? The <laughs> okay, there I see is. it. I see it. Okay, right. okay. Um, you yeah, use um, seconds, man. So you got but <laughs> okay, you because you know I can get a little long-winded with you. But first of all, I want to thank you for all the great things you've done in the community, Mr. Bell. You know. With the kids in trouble program and um, you know the tribute the tribute you did to Muhammad Ali and Jack Johnson up at the Charles Houston Rec Center, oh, yeah. also where I work at, and also honoring me with the the kids in trouble lifetime achievement award back in 2013. You know I guess you opened the gateway because once you um, honored me, um, the award started pouring in with the things that I've been doing in in the community. Because you know, I was never shy to go around and share my story and my testimony because of where God brought me from. And and I feel like He didn't bring me through what He brought me through for me not to give back. That's right. And um, you know, and my book is called The Beast Within, Still the Champ, because no matter what I went through, all the ups and downs, you know, I bounced back. I got back up, I brushed myself off. And you can find my book at on Amazon on Amazon or or on my website, www.thebeast.com. Okay. All right. The Thanks. Beast Within. Check me out if you need, um, you know, um, speaking engagements for the kids or, or um, you know, if you just want to read the book, you know, great story, comeback, you know, redemption. From the bottom to the top. Okay, Tony. Thank you. Okay, let's go uh, to my comedian old friend over here. Take a minute and, and take us out of here. Come on, Coy. All right, all right, all right. Thank you so much, folks, for having me. Look, it's been a it's been a pleasure hearing the stories and everything like that. Uh, you know, it's it's one of the things being a comedian is that you know people might look at me and say oh he's not funny but i tell you i'm like a boxer when it comes to the stage you hear me i'm the heavyweight when it comes to stand up comedy and uh i have a show that i definitely want everybody to check out it's a comedy game show called comic genius show 
and you can go to YouTube and see all the episodes, Comic Genius Show on YouTube. And also uh, you can go to hashtag PKG show. That's where me and a buddy of mine will upload things on Instagram that has everything to do with combat sports. Uh, it's a passion of mine. And uh, I appreciate everybody who has everything to do with the sport. And uh, I appreciate you, Harold Bell, Tony Suggs, the Taylor family, everybody. Um, the story about the Hank Aaron. I mean, it's, it's all good. It's all great. And I appreciate everybody. And I love everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I want to bring Chris in, my co-host. He hasn't had a chance to really say anything about uh, Hank Aaron or Muhammad Ali. And Chris, kind of give us uh, your thoughts. I'm um, just taking it all in. Like I said, um, most, those, most of those, those two are, are legends and pioneers in their own rights. And we've heard, you know, ad nauseum of, of, of their greatness and the different perspectives from, from different people who've had personal relationships with them, like, like yourself with Muhammad Ali and things like that. So I'm just, you know, soaking up the knowledge from the OGs and um, just trying to take notes and learn something. Okay. Gary, our, our man that runs the show for us, keeps us moving. Okay, look at Tony Suggs up there. Look at that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Tony and Muhammad Ali. All right. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, Michael Jackson, our uh, district attorney, gave me an idea because I'm I'm launching a, a, a new talk show on my own that I'm going to probably run on YouTube. But Michael gave me an idea because I really want to tail off and do stuff that's kind of connected to black men in America and just feature ordinary men who do extraordinary things. So when Michael was talking about what makes Tony Suggs different, how was he able to be one of the few people that went through what he went through and, and got out? Because a lot of them, you're right, they, they don't come out. And so, um, all right, the beast, I'm gonna be getting back in touch with you, man, because I'm gonna have you come back and tell that story. So um, I'll be getting in touch with you. But as far as today, you see my background. You see, you, Mr. Bell, have been the chosen one. Ali made you the chosen one. And so that's, that's what this day is about. And we got the other boxers there who've got extraordinary stories. And, and I'm just glad to be able to host this show uh, and put, use the platform to give you and Chris an opportunity to keep it going. So. I yield my time, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Let's go to Michael. Michael Jackson. Come on, carry us out, Michael. Hey, uh, John brought back memories. I, I was uh, all the way up to the fourth grade. I used to go to that boys club. I put on some gloves a couple of times. But <laughs> I didn't join then. Uh, that's funny how that works. And uh, y'all bring back a lot of memories because I used to be the chairman of the uh, youth center in Selma where the big thing was boxing. That's what the kids came and did and boxed and all. And uh the, what I, I unfortunately they closed now and I last time the, just recently I went to the Samuel John Boys Club and they were closed and I guess it was because of COVID. But I hope they reopen because we really need those kind of centers for these kids. We really do the boys club, the girls club, the youth centers. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are closing now. And so that's something we need to try to work on as a community. Okay, Michael, Herb, come on back in Herb and give us your thoughts as we go out of here. Thanks so much again. Herb, I'm mute Herb. You're on mute, Herb. You're on mute. You're Herb, mute, lower mute. left hand corner. <laughs> Still on mute. Okay. Okay. Here we go. All right. I appreciate you having me. Uh, Dave didn't get to say much, but Dave Sewell uh, was a, a good boxer. He was in Olympic trials and everything. Dave has a real story career. Dave's got a couple real good boxers right now. One of them is with uh, Floyd um, Malik. Uh, they call him Malik the King Warren. He's got Biggie. Uh, if you want to see some of what they've done, Max and Dave, go to uh, Charm City Boxing on um, – uh, YouTube, and there's also a channel called the South Atlantic Association of USA Boxing on YouTube. Both of those were my channels back in the day. I've kind of given it up for now, though. But um, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Uh, one theme that's been in my life with all of this boxing 
uh, I, I went to Charm City Boxing and I met Max and Dave uh, when I played a different sport. And there's some there's some race history that goes back because I grew up in Bussing. And um, Max is from Capitol Heights and me being from Bladensburg, the Bussing was going back and forth between those towns. There was a lot of strife back then. And in a way, this has been good healing uh, for me. And uh, we talk about God and uh, the man's uh, in rehab and stuff. And, and this is all providential to me. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity for having these friends and even this moment here. Thanks for having me. Okay, Herb. Jacques? Come on, Jacques. I just want to say uh, very quickly, uh, Herb, if I can get your attention. Uh, I grew up in Landover, uh, Palmer Park, back in the day. Uh, we moved out here in the uh, uh, early 70s, 68. And uh, we were very intimidated by the pagan motorcycle gang and the greasers. As you know, you know, the white guys used to always grease their hair back. I'm sure, you know, we probably ran each other. I'm 66 years of age. Uh, and, of course, I knew about the busing back in the day. Of course, I, I went from my heights. We were the only school in the county that had the white kids bust in and we refused to whip their tails. Unlike the whites at Blaisburg who fought the black students when the, that school was integrated. Uh, so it was definitely very, very racist. I come from, I was born in DC, but you know, I've had, I've lived in DC, Maryland and Virginia in the entire DMV. So I'm well aware of that history. Uh, and and uh, I'm glad that uh, all of us have come for a, cir a full circle. Cause there was at one time, you know, I despise anything was white. I didn't even, want to wear white underwear, you know, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I, so I, so like you Herb, I've, I've come full circle too, you <laughs> know, uh, I never did white drugs. Uh, uh, I can't, you know, uh, 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 associate with Anthony, what you've done. I would always say white drugs, white woman, white underwear, ain't had nothing to do with it, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, so it's kind of a little bit of humor in there as well, but I also appreciate all the knowledge and the wisdom that was shared today and everybody's story. And uh, I just like Anthony. Did you, did you ever meet my brother Kenny at all, or uh, the Taylors uh, when he was refereeing, or as he refereed? I yeah, I've been in the ring with so well. I, um, He done did so many of my fights. I can't even count how many of my fights he done done. Okay. Yeah, so tell him I said what's up, and I'm sure he will he will remember me. You know, okay. all the people I knocked hey, out. Just keep okay. it moving. Uh, John Hollins, come on in, John. Give us a. A going away uh, presentation. John, are you still there? John, I am still here. Okay. I, I, I got a, a brother that just called me uh, with something uh, serious that I need to talk to him about. Oh, but okay. it's been a pleasure to be on your call. Always, Harold. And uh, great meeting all of you guys. Uh, anytime you get a chance to meet Harold uh, for one day or a lifetime, it's going to better your life because he's going to speak the truth. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Timothy, you got one minute. Um, I, I just want to let everybody know, um, please get, get with Harold this there's, there's a, there's a window, there's a real small window that is going to open up the floodgates for opportunity for everybody. And when I tell y'all this, I'm talking about, I've created the first philanthropy Congress in the world. I've also created the, uh, the first exchange that has to do with brand reputation of people, products, business services. It is a stock exchange that will, uh, it mirrors all 144 stock exchanges around the world. This is very big. And yes, I did it myself, 20 years in the making. So get with Harold, trust and believe. We're talking about an amount of money that you have never, you have never imagined. And it's right here, right now. Thank you all for being on this call and continue to do what you do and continue to share uh, you, what your achievements are. The Heavenly Father has been gracious to give you your talents and abilities and capabilities uh, for you and your families and for those that value you and what you've achieved uh, so far. Mm -hmm. I look forward to meeting and talking to with all of you very shortly and very soon. Take care. Okay. I want to I want to go out here. I cannot go out here without showing you guys this video and bringing this story to you. But because it still tells you where we are today as a country, man, that this this country is still 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 racist as it can be. That we got cops out there who are paid assassins. I I I came upon a story where this young brother in Atlanta, Georgia, was shot sixty 
76 times in Atlanta in 2016. One was a U.S. Marshal and the other guy was a cop. And look, he, this, this brother that got shot had no criminal record. He didn't have a gun. They had a fugitive warrant out for him. Gary, can we run a minute of that video? U.S. Marshal and police charged with murder. Yep, a murder that took place in 2016 has finally, finally seen some semblance of justice. Let me take you to Atlanta, Georgia. Now, I was deeply involved in this case from day one. I've stood with the family. I've had rallies, protests. We've talked about it on my various platforms leading up to this moment. Let me put up a picture of the young man they killed. This is Jamarian Robinson. A grand jury on Tuesday returned an eight count indictment against two law enforcement officers in connection with the 2016 killing of a man shot. How many times? 76. 76 times they shot at him about 100. 76 times, okay? Jamarion had no weapon, he had no gun on him. He was shot 76 times. Uh, this was during an attempted fugitive arrest in Atlanta uh, metropolitan area, okay? Eric Hines, let me start here, Eric Hines, uh, who is an assistant chief inspector with the US Marshals Southeast Regional Fugitive Task Force. And Christopher Hutchins, a Clayton County police officer that's in the metropolitan area of Atlanta. They were working on the task force together. They were formally charged with felony murder, aggravated assault, burglary, making false statements and violation of oath by a public officer. Yeah, that's what's happening, man. This is still the country <laughs> that it is, man. This is this is what it is. I know I don't want to get into a discussion on it, but I would just want to pull your coattails to say, man, it's still dangerous out here. Not only do we have to, to duck the thugs, duck COVID, we got to duck the cops. You hear what I'm saying? And I've been saying this for decades, man, decades. And anytime a cop does not turn on his camera, he should be fired immediately, immediately. They're still covering this stuff up, man. And we cannot sit back and say nothing. We cannot allow these, these mayors, these city councilmen, these people on Capitol Hill, New York City Police Department Union has $11 billion in their kitty. $11 billion used to get these cops off when they do these egregious things against our people. So I want you, I want you to think about that. And as I go, go out of here, man, I, I've lost 10 friends or close associates of mine in the past year. And one was Dr. Gil Hoffman, uh, a guy that took me in when I had no place, when I was homeless, I was married. He had to take me in. Dr. Ed Wells, a dear friend and mentor, lost him. Dick Johnson, my, my captain of my football team at Winston-Salem State University, that was a dear friend. Irvin Brown, the captain of the, my football and basketball team at Spangard High School, just lost him. Roland Tiny Grimes. Sylvester Monk Stevens, Donald Beasley, and Bob Furr, who used to be the general manager of the Washington Bullets. All those were close friends, man. So our time, it may be over at any time, so stand up. And I want you to remember as we go out of here with Herb. Herb, you know what I always say, and I've been saying this for years, that every black face you see is not your brother, and every white face is not your enemy. And you cannot soar with eagles if you're hanging out with chickens. You know, until next Sunday, I'm Harold Bell and looking forward to having you back anytime you're welcome. Gary? Thank you, everybody. Thank you for making us have a great show.
and uh, be safe. This broadcast will be uh, recorded and uploaded on blackmeninamerica.com, probably around midnight tonight, if not sooner. And you can see it and then share the link with all of your family and friends and on your social media platforms. So if you have any questions, just get to me at Gary at blackmeninamerica.com or check in with Mr. Bell. He will have the link and we'll, everybody can see it. Until then, stay safe. Later. Hi, I'm Harold Bell. My wife Hattie and I found the nonprofit organization in 1968, shortly after the riots that almost destroyed my hometown, Washington, D.C. The program caters to the needs of at-risk children as it relates to social services such as education, law enforcement, drug abuse, gang-related violence, and other antisocial behavior. 